Smash Mouth would appear on everyone's radars in 1997 with the release of their debut record Fushu Mang, which featured the massive hit Walking on the Sun. The song, which was actually inspired by the Los Angeles riots of 1992, would shoot to number two on the mainstream top 40 charts and help push the group's first record to go double platinum. Given that Walking on the Sun sounded so drastically different from the rest of the album, which was mostly pop punk and ska punk, it had the dubious distinction of being one of the most returned albums in history. The band would admit to Spin Magazine that some people even thought that Smash Mouth were originally a Christian band, given the lyrical nature of Walking on the Sun, but they weren't. Despite the success out of the gate, many wrote off Smash Mouth as just another one-hit wonder who would never have repeated success in their career, but the next several years showed that the band had plenty of more hits in their arsenal, one of which would be the biggest song of their career. I'm of course talking about the song All Star, and today we're going to take a look at the history of the song, how it nearly never made it into Shrek, how the author of the song wasn't a fan of it, and thought it would pigeonhole the band for the rest of their career, and finally the lasting impact of it on our culture. Smash Mouth's classic lineup would be made up of Steve Harwell on vocals, Greg Camp on guitar, Paul Delisle on bass, and Kevin Coleman on drums. They would form in the mid-90s in San Jose, California, and they would owe much of their early success to Carson Daly, who was a DJ in both San Diego and Los Angeles who promoted the band's material on his shows. They would nab a recording deal with Interscope, who put out their debut record, Fushu Mang. It was following the success of the group's first record that they were now enlisted to do a cover of the Four Seasons track, Can't Get Enough of You Baby, for the 1998 teen comedy, Can't Hardly Wait. It was another hit for the group, and the song would also appear on their second album as well. In late 1998, Smash Mouth would hand in what would be their second record named Astro Lounge to their label. But there was a problem. The head of their label, Interscope, Tom Wally, didn't hear a hit. He soon sent the band away and told them to write a few more songs with the aim of them being radio friendly. The band were basically in a do or die situation. They didn't want to be known as one hit wonders, but at the same time, guitarist Greg Camp, who was also the group's principal songwriter, was conflicted. Having come from a punk background, he didn't like being told what to write by the label, and there was also this constant pressure on him to deliver. Camp soon found inspiration from a few places when crafting a few more songs for the record. He got an issue of Billboard magazine and looked at the charts and saw Bare Naked Ladies song one week and tried to write something in a similar vein. When it came to the lyrics, he didn't have to look very far as he took inspiration from the band's fan mail, where a lot of Smash Mouth fans would write to the band telling them that they were being bullied and picked on for simply liking the band. Camp wanted to write an inspirational type of song for them, the final piece of the puzzle would be an ex-girlfriend of Camp who doubted his dream of being a rock star. And then for the song's title, he looked at the Converse sneakers he was wearing, which said All Star on them. Camp would also come up with another song during this time called Then the Morning Comes, which documented the difficulty of being a touring musician while also being in a relationship. In fact, he would credit Smash Mouth's grueling tour schedule for their first record as leading to him getting divorced. Camp would present the songs to his bandmates, telling them, and I quote, there's one I really like referring to Then the Morning Comes, one I kinda hate referring to All Star, but I think it's gonna work. Camp had originally written a line in the song All Star that said, say bye bye to your soul, a reference to abiding by the label's wishes, but it would later be changed to all thy glitters as gold. Upon hearing All Star, the group's frontman Steve Harwell knew it was going to be a smash hit, we're calling to the Baltimore Sun. We were going Gatorade, football, baseball, basketball. This song is going to be everywhere. But their producer, Eric Valentine, had a dire warning for the group, adding, it's going to sail this band straight into the sun like there's no turning back. You cannot put that toothpaste back in the tube. He was of course referring to the fact that the band would now be pigeonholed for the rest of their career if they were to put the song out. When All Star was presented to the band's label, they had some suggestions on changing it. Since the song begins with vocals before the music comes in, the label and even some radio stations were concerned that radio DJs would simply talk over the song. Camp would tell Ringer, Radio DJs like to talk over the beginning of your song, he was told, which made me fight for that even more. You know, well, maybe they should shut up when our song plays. Smash Mouth would release their sophomore effort, Astro Lounge, in June of 1999. The record was more cohesive this time around, focusing more on a pop sound, which disappointed some of their older fans. 
The band would also have a change of drummers as Kevin Coleman left due to health issues and Michael Urbano would play on the record. Smash Mouth would also add a fifth member and keyboardist Michael Kluster, expanding the group to a five-piece. Released several weeks before Astro Lounge hit stores, All Star would peak at number four on the Billboard Hot 100 charts, their highest charting song of their career. It would also be featured in the Ben Stiller movie Mystery Men, with Stiller and the cast actually appearing in the music video for the song. Then fast forward to early 2001 and movie studio DreamWorks had a film named Shrek coming out about a mean ogre and they needed a song for the opening sequence and another song for the last scene. DreamWorks had temporarily put in Smash Mouth's All-Star as a stand-in for the opening scene. Matt Mahaffey, who was signed to DreamWorks' record company, was asked to come up with an original song in the same vein as All-Star. You have to remember that by 2001, All-Star had been licensed at least four dozen times, so the team at DreamWorks didn't want to use something that was already beaten to death. The song that year had already appeared in the film Rat Race, with the band also appearing in the film. Mahaffey saw a rough cut of the film to get inspiration for the track, and the studio even enlisted Smash Mouth's producer Eric Valentine to work on the track. The team at DreamWorks working on the film loved what Mahaffey had come up with. In fact, it was the only piece of original music in Shrek. But that all soon changed. When the opening sequence was shown to DreamWorks CEO Jeffrey Kassenberg, he turned to the team working on Shrek and asked them, why don't you just use All Star? In addition to using All Star, Smash Mouth would be asked to contribute a song to the film for the outro scene, which they did, which was a cover of the Monkees tune, I'm a Believer, that also proved to be a hit song. While All Star was already a hit, Shrek gave the song a second life as the movie grossed hundreds of millions of dollars, and the band was shocked at the success of the film with Harwell recalling to Rolling Stone, we had no clue how big Shrek was going to be. We had no clue. That was just a launching pad. The song was already a number one single, and then Shrek came out and we sold millions of records off that alone. The song was reborn again. Meanwhile, guitarist Greg Camp was initially against licensing the tune to Shrek, but he lost that fight telling song facts. Back then, that's what it was. You don't put your songs in commercials, maybe a cool film or something. Even Shrek, I was kind of like, well, this is going to put us into this sort of Disney zone, and we're going to be writing for children and families now. I don't think that we should do that. It was this feeling that created some tension between Camp and the rest of the band. But it wasn't just the band members, it was also the group's manager as well. Smash Mouth's manager was really one of the first managers to explore the combination of music and marketing. His rationale, as he explained to Metroactive, was, and I quote, more people watch TV than listen to the radio. Every night you're watching a show, then it's Jesus Christ, there's that f***ing Smash Mouth song again. This in turn exposes the band to more people, and this results in more radio playlist ads, and thus more record sales, he would say. The band soon became inescapable in the years that followed, as their songs were widely used in commercials, appearing in Gatorade ads, ads for Nissan, Pizza Hut, and Pepsi, and the band themselves would even appear in some of these commercials, like this one for Progressive Auto Insurance for a Super Bowl halftime show, where they performed All Star. You may be wondering, how much does a band make for licensing a single song? Well, their manager claimed that they licensed the tune When the Morning Comes to Nissan for $1.5 million. Even by 2019, Smash Mouth was still receiving several offers a week just to license their music, mostly All-Star. Generally, the band says yes to licensing the song unless somebody wants to change the lyrics to sell a particular product. The band have been attacked by some people who claim they're only famous because of the movie Shrek, but that wasn't really true as they had had success prior to 2001. Smash Mouth bassist Paul Delisle would write in his 2015 memoir, Walking on the Sun, that Shrek was, and I quote, inarguably the single most profound event in Smash Mouth history. He would also admit in an interview that he made enough just on the royalties from the song to be able to buy a house. All Star received another boost over the past decade as it's grown in popularity as an internet meme and it's been parodied countless times and has been ranked as one of the most streamed songs from 2017 to 2021 in the United States. These days it seems like the band is more at peace with how the internet has treated the song. That does it for today's video guys, thanks for watching and we'll see you again in Rock and Roll True Stories.